Hey, this is LGBTQ and A. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is a show where we get to know different members of the LGBTQ community. Today, I'm talking with Cleve Jones. Cleve is a legendary activist. He worked with and was mentored by Harvey Milk. He created the AIDS Memorial Quilt, and his new memoir, When We Rise, is part of the inspiration for the miniseries of the same name. Stay tuned. Hey, Cleve. Hey. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk. I I love the book. Thank you. I think it's so important. And uh, I just, I've never read such a collection of our history of like the movement. I don't know many other books like this and it really meant a lot to me. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. I, I was hoping that younger people would read it and I'm delighted that you are. So Go thank ahead. You. <laughs> Got one off. <laughs> um, things have changed so quickly in your lifetime. Uh, due in part to a lot of the work that your generation did. I don't know that my generation recognizes that as much as I wish. I got in an argument just recently with a young man in a club who uh, just flat out denied that it had ever been illegal to be gay. He simply did not know that when I was his age, when I was just coming out, it was a felony. And every police department in every major city in this country had... Uh, special sections whose sole purpose was to hunt down, entrap, arrest, and imprison homosexuals for consenting behavior between adults. That's the reality I came out into. And this guy did not know that no, at all? No, he, he had no clue. Wow. Yeah, and that, that troubles me. Another thing that bothers me about the, uh, the millennials is how little they seem to understand about what happened to our people during the HIV pandemic, the, the, the dark decade and a half before treatment became available. In my neighborhood, the Castro in San Francisco, we uh, lost about 2,000 men a year for over a decade. And it, it, it troubles me that young people don't know that history. So I try to, I'm trying to inform people. Good, yeah. I mean, because when we grew up, pride parades were a fact of life. Yeah. There are these things that happened. And so, I mean, sometimes I wonder if it's, it, this goes to like the larger message of words like losing meaning. Because you can say 2,000 people a year died and my brain is able to register that's horrible, but I'm still able to go about my day. Well, I think it's it's probably indicative of our culture's view of history in general. Uh, we don't teach it. We don't learn it. We don't learn from it. Uh, the world changes so rapidly and these things are forgotten, but it's important to know. And it's not about being nostalgic or wistful about the good old days, because part of, most of the good old days were also pretty grim. Not quite as grim as what we're facing now, I fear. But, uh, yeah, I wanted people to know about that time when the notion of the gay community was new. Uh, I think we were kinder to each other then. Uh, it was electric. It was very exciting. It was very romantic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And speaking about it being illegal before, I was amazed to read that printing the word homosexual in a publication was considered pornographic and grounds to shut down a paper or a publication. Yeah, so even very serious gay literary journals were forbidden to be mailed across state lines or international boundaries. There was a very famous case with a wonderful uh, magazine out of Toronto called The Body Politic, where people were actually arrested uh, on charge of interstate transportation of pornography. And this was a very serious political journal. Wow. So you first saw the word homosexual in Time magazine? Life magazine. Life magazine? Yes. It was the Year in Review issue, 1971, Life magazine, and it was an eight or nine page spread called Homosexuals in Revolt. And one of the first pictures showed all these hot guys with long hair and their fists in the air confronting the police in Greenwich Village. And just completely blew my mind and changed my life forever. So because you had never heard the word before, what you recognized was like yourself and these men? Oh no, unfortunately I had heard oh, the you word had. because I'd been getting called variations of it all through middle school and high school and my father was a psychologist. So I remember you know, going home from school one day in tears after being called a homo and a fag and I, uh, I said to one of the boys, why do you call me that? What does that mean? He said, you're a homosexual and you're gonna go to hell, you're sick. And I looked it up in my father's books, and what one read then in the, you know, in the psychological literature was horrifying. It, it was just terrible, and, and the, the cures, the treatments that were offered included electroconvulsive shock therapy, lobotomies, 
Um, so I didn't tell my parents until I turned 18 because I was sure that they would have me committed, have me institutionalized. And I know men of my age and older who actually survived that kind of barbaric treatment, which is now fortunately a, a thing of the past in our country. But yeah, so I knew the word for sure, but I didn't know that there was a community. I didn't know that there was a movement. I'd already been involved in the anti-war movement and supported the civil rights movement and the women's movement. And when I learned that part of that big global movement for peace and for social justice included people like me. And that was just the most amazing revelation. And I got the hell out of Phoenix as soon as I could and got up to San Francisco. Yeah. Why was it important for you back then to tell your parents and come out versus moving to San Francisco and not telling them? Because you could have easily just gone. A big part of the movement then was this whole issue of coming out. And uh, I'm frustrated when I hear young people tell me that they don't feel the need to label themselves or come out, and I get part of it. You know, you don't want to be labeled, you don't want to be restricted or confined in any way. Okay, I get that part of it, but uh, it still sounds like a closet to me. And uh, the, the reason is that it's so important is because once the haters know that they have queer and trans people in their families, in their workplace, in their neighborhood, on their block, in their congregation, in their school. Once they know they know us, it becomes very difficult for them to continue to hate us and more difficult for them to vote against us or harm us. So coming out has always been an essential part of this movement. And that was something that was articulated very powerfully by Harvey Milk. Uh, during his uh, campaigns in San Francisco. But you you came out like 17, 18, you said? Yeah, I was 17. So, so you knew how important it was even then? Because that's yeah. so many years before you met Harvey. No, I, I, was, I joined the Gay Liberation Front, and that was uh, the rallying cry, we have to come out, we have to come out. And it, it's, uh, it, it seems so simplistic in some ways, but it's really a very powerful notion, and it's a big part of why we have come as far as we have within my lifetime. It's because ordinary people, not famous people, not Hollywood people, not political people, but ordinary queers made that bold decision to say, Mom, Dad, this is who I am, to t reveal their, their true identity, not only to family, but to, to clergy, to employers, to the military. Yeah, it was real, it was real bravery. Wow. When, when you got to San Francisco, there and then for the rest of your life, just the communities that you've been a part of and like seeking out community of like-minded people, whether you created them or found them was such a recurring theme. Does that, where is that community now that SF has changed? Well, that's a very good question. It's something that I, I think about a lot right now because the reality is that the neighborhoods are going away. So if you look at San Francisco's Castro District or Seattle's Capitol Hill or Washington, D.C.'s DuPont Circle or Boys Town in Chicago or West Hollywood or anywhere you want to look, Lavender Heights in Sacramento, wherever you, you look where there's a defined gay neighborhood, it's not just a place where there's bars, though bar life has always been an important part of our culture. It's where very important things happen. First is political power. When we are concentrated in specific precincts, that gives us the power to elect our own to public office, the, the power to defeat our opponents, the power to pass legislation that directly affects our lives and our well-being. As we are dispersed, we lose that power. Another super important part of it was the cultural vitality. Look at all the amazing stuff that's come out of West Hollywood, that's come out of my neighborhood. I mean, it's no coincidence that the rainbow flag and the first gay synagogue and the first gay film festival and the AIDS Memorial Quilt and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence all were born in the Castro because there's that magic that happens when creative people, when choreographers and filmmakers and dancers and DJs and painters are all in that same area. And I know that collaboration can occur very effectively online. But there's nothing like the magic of face-to-face, -face, eye contact, close proximity for that cultural vitality. And then the third thing that's at risk are the specialized social services for our most vulnerable population. So uh, 
whether we're talking about people like myself who are getting old, long-term survivors of HIV, or queer kids, trans kids who are fleeing Trump's America, where did they go? They can't come to the Castro. A little crappy studio apartment in the Castro is going to cost you $2,500 a month. So this is the reality that uh, nobody's really quite talking about, is that that community that has given us so much and strengthened us and inspired us and moved us forward is really being threatened. And there's many factors, uh, technology, uh, many people will say, oh, well, we can live anywhere we want. No, you can't. Ha! Huh. Don't tell me that. Try it. You know, go to Duluth and walk down Main Street and hold hands. No offense to Duluth or any other city you might want to try doing that outside of the gayborhood. So we need these, these spaces. They're important, and we need to figure out what's our next move. Yeah. It, do you have a solution? <laughs> oh, there's, there's, there's no easy solution. But yeah, when people say, oh, Cleve, you know, um, cities change. Well, duh. Thank you for that brilliant observation. Yes, of course cities change, but we want to be thinking about that change. And the big factor is that cities have changed in a way that's profoundly new. Uh, for generations since the Industrial Revolution, the cities were the place where refugees went, immigrants, bohemians, counterculture people, artists, homosexuals. And uh, all these people of all these different backgrounds and ethnicities and genders would, you know, create this, these cauldrons of creativity and, and, and then they would climb their way up the economic ladder and move out to the suburbs. And that was really accelerated in the post-war era, the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, the phenomena of white flight. So when I got to San Francisco, the population of that city had been declining steadily since the end of World War II. And we were able to t go into these neighborhoods that had been largely abandoned by the working class immigrants that had built them originally and create what we created, first on Polk Street, then on Castro and Folsom Street and Haight Street, you know, these really vibrant communities. These are now some of the most expensive neighborhoods in the world. So the district that gave us Harvey Milk is now inhabited increasingly by white, heterosexual, cisgendered millionaires. Yeah, it was just like, I was blown away by just the collective mindset too. When you arrived in San Francisco, you had a sleeping bag and a couple shirts and $42. And you were welcomed into this guy's home that you had never met who was not expecting you. That you, you just, it was an address you had from a friend. And it was a safe place to live and to get on your feet. I don't know, yeah. even if it's not San Francisco, like that mentality is so unique. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's pretty much gone now, partly because it's just so difficult to survive. So the young people I meet in their early 20s, you know, these, and of course, San Francisco, it's all tech. Uh, and there's a lot of anger towards the tech invaders. But I have a lot of empathy and, and uh, real concern for them because, first of all, most of them are working 60, 70 hours a week. They have no job security. They're, they would never use the, the phrase exploited workers to describe themselves, but you are, Blanche, you are. And also, you know, they carry this, uh, most of them, this huge student loan debt. So survival is much more difficult. But I think also back then, and especially in San Francisco, it was still kind of hippy dippy. It was very counterculture. It was very communal. And everybody was kind of expected and really encouraged to contribute in some way. You didn't necessarily have to be all that good at what you did, but you needed to do something, whether it was a drag show or a video or a film or a poetry contest or something. There was a there was a real nurturing of people's creative impulses and a lot of support for it. There were so many places I knew where if I was hungry, I could just show up and there would be a, every night there would be a communal potluck dinner. There were probably six or seven of those households within a few blocks of where I was living on Castro Street. So I never went hungry. Wow. And it's a, that community, too, that was so good at problem solving. Uh, when AIDS came about, absolutely sure. But also I'm thinking of like the Butterfly Brigade yeah. to protect the streets. Yeah. We were, and 
you know, that's another, that's a, a good point. I think today people have this expectation that their problems are going to be dealt with by some agency somewhere or some existing long-standing organization. Uh, we had to create everything from scratch. So when the fag bashers came into the Castro from the suburbs uh, to beat us up, the police didn't protect us. The police were all Irish and Italian Catholics, no offense to either demographic, but they were pretty freaking homophobic and just as likely to beat you up as the bashers. So we had to defend ourselves. We had to create street patrols and buy walkie talkies and learn self-defense and get pepper spray and beat the crap out of anybody that came in our neighborhood and caused trouble because the police wouldn't deal with it. When AIDS came, you know, we had a president at the time who has since been elevated to sainthood in some quarters. His name was Reagan. He didn't say the word AIDS publicly until more Americans had died of it than died in the entire Vietnam War. We were on our own. So people were starving to death because they were too weak to get food. So we fed them. People were being thrown out by landlords who were terrified of the purple spots on their faces. And we housed them. And people were abandoned by their families and left alone by their clergymen. And so we comforted them. And that's what we had to do. We, we, we had no choice. Uh, before we met, I wanted to ask how you formed these communities and met people but it seems like you already answered it that it was just a different time and place you go to the bar and you talk to people right that sounds like <laughs> radical here today i still organize out of the bars <laughs> whenever, whenever i'm planning a march or picket line or rally I, the first my first stop is the mix bar on 18th and castro <laughs> That's where I recruit my young people. <laughs> yeah, because when I go to the bar, I meet three friends there. And until they get there, I sit quietly. And look at your device, probably. I actually don't do that. But Good for you. But do, consciously. Do, do you make eye contact with people? I do. I always talk with the bartender, but I've, it, I don't have enough confidence yet to turn to the person next to me and say, like, no. what do you, what's up? You know? Yeah, I don't know. Your generation seems to have, have lost the art of cruising and eye contact. Uh, so. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love the stories of Buena Vista Park. Yeah. It, it sounds like a, like a Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> you know, you go in, it's foggy, and you come out with a lover. <laughs> yeah, I had a treehouse up there. It was really, uh, you know, um, it was a very romantic time. And I, I think there's always a tendency to mythologize, and that can't be helped. But it was absolutely a unique and amazing moment in time and uh, when I left home I didn't speak to my father for many years and then the the the, uh, the winter after Harvey Milk and George Moscone were killed I went back to Phoenix for holidays with my parents and late one night after my father had gone to bed my mom and I stayed up drinking wine and talking and she was an amazing woman who lived her own amazing experience in New York uh, in the 40s when she left home in Michigan and went to New York to dance and ended up in the Martha Graham Company and moved in very bohemian circles. And so after, I think, the second glass of red wine, she said, you know, you're you're living in one of those amazing periods of, of history. And when you are old, people will be writing books and making movies about the life you're living now. <laughs> she called it. She was right. Yeah. Wow. So were your parents aware of the contributions you were making to the movement? I didn't talk to my parents for a while. Um, they started to come around. My, my mother was never the issue. It was always my father, who was very much a Freudian psychologist. But uh, I mean, mom was always pretty cool. Uh, they started to come around after Harvey was shot because they knew that I was working with him and that he had, they liked him because Harvey had persuaded me to go back to college. He bribed me with an internship. I, I have the attention span of a lima bean. I hate school. But he got me back in class and earning credits by working in his office. So they kind of liked him. And when they heard on the radio while coming home from work what had happened, their first thought was, was I OK? And then uh, I think they felt genuine sadness. And then so that began a process of reconciliation. And then by the time AIDS came, in uh, the 80s, 
they were right there. I mean, they did everything they could. They marched, they made quilts, they went to conferences, they, they became activists, they became AIDS activists. Wow, that's really nice. Well, I think it's, I know, I mean, I imagine right now there's some young person listening who's just come out to his or her parents and, and they're not dealing with it very well and, and maybe it's really ugly and maybe it's scary and maybe you're hurt, but um, give them some time because so often it takes a while for parents to absorb this information, but most parents, I think, really do just love their kids. And a lot of times that response is really out of fear uh, that something bad is going to happen to their kid. So, uh, yeah, they changed. Absolutely. Y you mentioned the AIDS quilt. Uh, it was a massive undertaking, but, it, and I don't want to trivialize it with one detail, but I was blown away that you wrote that Rosa Parks made panels for it. Yes, I got to meet Mrs. Parks in Detroit. I was there for a, a convention of PFLAGS, the Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays organization, and... Uh, it was funny because they didn't tell me who I was going to meet. They, but when I got my schedule for the weekend, it, I was annoyed because they said that on Sunday I had to get up at 6 o'clock and wear a suit and tie. And I'm like, what the heck? I don't want to get up Sunday morning. And, um, but they were insistent, and it was to go meet Mrs. Parks at her church. And I got to uh, go to church with her, and then I was invited up to, to speak to the congregation. And then I got to take her out to lunch. And she made panel, quilt panels for... Um, a family where the three generations of women in that family uh, lost their lives to AIDS. The grandmother had had a, a hip replacement surgery and had a transfusion before the blood supply had been secured. And then her daughter uh, had had some issues uh, with drugs and contracted it and passed it on to her infant girl before she realized that she was HIV positive. So it was a, a really very tragic example of how horrible that disease was. And Mrs. Parks, uh, you know, to have her support and, to, and just to the amazing privilege of being in a room with her, being in a car with her, sitting at a table with her and sharing a meal was something I will never forget. <laughs> wow. I'd yeah. never heard that before about her in yeah. the quilt. I got to meet a lot of my greatest heroes. That's one of the things that's been pretty sweet about my life. And um, I met uh, I met Cesar Chavez. I got to march with Cesar Chavez a couple of times. Um, I got to meet Nelson Mandela and have a, a short but like 20 minute private conversation with him about the efficacy of AIDS medications. And it was timely because his successor, Thabo Mbeke, was you know was scrambling around for excuses to not pay the money to treat the millions of people in South Africa who are HIV positive, and I was able to beg Nelson Mandela to speak out against this, and uh, I was one of many people who were trying to pressure Mandela to 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 speak out, and ultimately he did, and saved many 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 lives. Wow. I was really surprised by how much information you had early on, it seemed, in the book. Like, you were talking about it as an epidemic and as a sexually transmitted virus early on. I didn't know that we found out those things quite so early. Well, at the beginning, it was very mysterious and terribly frightening. And, of course, a lot of people responded uh, inappropriately or worse. But um, by 1985, it was pretty was well established there's still a lot of myths and stupid things out there about it but I I think I knew what was happening before it was proven just because I was working with a guy named Dr. Marcus Conant who was one of the real heroes of the pandemic and he in 1981 just after the first reports he saw some of the first patients in San Francisco um, including my friend Bobby Campbell uh, but he made sort of a leap, and he, one night at dinner at the Zuni Cafe, he said, I, I think it's a new virus, I think it's sexually transmitted, I think it can remain dormant in the body for a long time, and that it's fatal. And the way he delivered that news to me, uh, I remember looking up and saying, well, then we're all dead. 
because it's it, it's the components of the perfect storm. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I think this is another thing that maybe it might be harder for younger people today to understand now that there's so many representations of of lesbians and gay men and bisexual people and now even transgender people, but back then we had been uh, our our sexuality had been so repressed so attacked and and it was part of the it, we were a sexual liberation movement then i mean that was the phrase that we used this was sexual liberation it was about you know tearing off the puritan shackles of of america and uh exploring our sexuality in a way that was very joyous and hot and exciting and uh, it, I think, in some ways, it, it was maybe even you know more important than it is now because it had been so repressed and so hidden and and uh, condemned. Uh, so, you know, to say to all of these people who had been exploring this and celebrating this suddenly, this is death. Uh, you know, it was really difficult for people to comprehend. I think it would, I know that the sexual liberation aspect is so important to it, but I think it would have been very easy to leave that out of the book. And I was really, really happy to read about your sexual experiences, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Well, I know my audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I just like, like, thank you. Like, it's easy to paint these perfect pictures of people that are important and that we look up to and to know that they enjoy and have an active sex life. It's okay. And so, uh, like, thank you for including that. Well, it was discussed with my publisher, uh, but I, I, it's not graphic, uh, but it was an important part of my story. It's an important part of who I am. And my first book, Stitching a Revolution, which was mostly about the AIDS Memorial Quilt, I didn't like it uh, because the the my editor removed all of those references and it uh, so when I started this book that was part of what I knew was going to be in there I was going to describe accurately and clearly without being graphic or sensational about it what my life was like and for me especially in my youth being sexual was a big part of it and it wasn't just about the sex it was about the relationships that came out of that I mean most of my dearest friends, you know, were people I, I and there's like, like the scene in the in the in the miniseries where I I I try to make out with my friend Marvin. He says, "Oh, girl, we're gonna be sisters." And you know, that's it, it was like you would you'd meet someone, you'd go home, and okay, maybe it was good sex, maybe it was mediocre sex, but there was a connection, and then you would become best friends forever and that is a massive part of gay relationships that no one talks about it is it's a big part of the way especially gay men live their lives yeah one of my favorite parts of the book was had nothing to do with the movement it was when you were in greece and you stumble <laughs> upon this fire pit of german sol or greek soldiers yeah. um and i remember how you described it because you end up rolling around with one of them in the sand and you said that he was breathing into your hair whispering in Greek words that you did not know, but understood. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. You can't, and, like, um, you can't say that's pornographic, you know? <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, I liked hitchhiking. I, I, uh, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and it, it was pre-AIDS, so, like, there's nothing to worry about mm -hmm. in your mind, you know? It was, uh, it's a wonderful thing when you are able to connect with a stranger under any circumstances. I think that's a wonderful thing. But when he happens to be a hot Greek soldier and you're on a beach, <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, last thing about, um, or not last thing, but about the AIDS crisis. You were in San Francisco during this. H how aware of you were you of other things going on in other cities, like the gay men's health crisis in New York with Larry Kramer and different places? Well, when Larry published his first article about it, I was very excited because I knew that Larry could reach the guys on Fire Island. And so the, the, the gay culture in New York was completely different from the gay scene in San Francisco. And back then, each city had a, each city's gay community, which is what, what the term we used then, um, was very distinct. I write about it. I say some boys went to L.A., 
they wore, wore gold chains and bleached their hair and went to auditions, you know. And some boys went to New York and they did real theater and or worked for law firms. And in San Francisco, we were poets and wore button fly jeans and stapled our posters to the telephone poles. But uh, we were all very connected and AIDS required us to collaborate in a new way. And so these very sort of parochial LGBT organizations, I mean, we didn't pull off our first march uh, the first national march until 1979 after Harvey died. Uh, people had been talking about doing a march on Washington for years and years and years and years, but nobody could get the queens in each city to agree. Everybody had their little fiefdoms. Harvey's death created really the space for that first march to happen. AIDS created something else. When you look like Harvey's last campaign, when he finally won, I can't remember exactly, but I think our total campaign budget was something like $30,000, which was then to us an enormous sum of money. Within a few years of the onset of AIDS, LGBT communities all around the country were routinely raising and spending millions of dollars to build the infrastructure necessary to care for all these people, educate, do the prevention campaign. So. I think AIDS tested us in a very horrible way, but uh, and one doesn't ever want to say, you know, that something good comes out of such a, 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 a an overwhelming tragedy. But I would say that the the notion of an LGBT community was really a notion until AIDS came, and it proved it proved us. It said, yes, this isn't about just tricking and drinking and and going to the circuit parties. There's more to it, and we were challenged, it, it'd be, it would be difficult to imagine a challenge more horrifying than what we went through uh, to see all of these young men die. But it proved us. And I would also say that um, there's a bit of, of revisionism going on right now, especially among young people who, I've, I've, I hear this now with, with, with great frequency, that the focus on marriage equality was somehow imposed down on the community by the more wealthy white men who run the big national organizations in order to raise money to pay their fat salaries. That is not true. Uh, marriage equality, the, the focus on marriage equality came from working class and middle class people who in the course of fighting the pandemic came to understand how important that little piece of paper was. I came out of gay liberation. Marriage was a vestige of the patriarchy, as far as we were concerned. That was on no one's list that I knew, except that long list of injustices and rights and privileges that were denied us. But I didn't know anyone who actually wanted to get married until AIDS came. And then you saw people who died because they weren't married and didn't have insurance coverage. And you saw people who died alone because their partner of 25 years was not allowed in the ICU. So suddenly, for all sorts of ordinary people, not activists, not entertainers, not leaders, but ordinary people, suddenly came to understand not only how much marriage mattered, but also there was this new attitude. Um, and I don't know what I'm, what words I'm allowed and not allowed to use it's on the this web, show. Use I can you say want. whatever I want. Yeah. Good. So, you know, after that, after that experience, uh, it was like, what do you mean this isn't a marriage? Fuck you. This is exactly what a marriage looks like. You know, and you saw the dedication of these couples, these guys who'd been together. Who, whose relationship was never acknowledged by the church or the state, and yet there they are, day after day, night after night, wiping the sweat, emptying the bedpans, putting in the IV lines, measuring out the pills and the medication, day after month after year after year. What do you mean that's not a marriage? Fuck you, this is a marriage, and we want all the rights and all the privileges that come with it, just as straight people do. And by the way, those, you know, national organizations like Human Rights Campaign and, and all of the others, uh, they opposed the effort to go to federal court. They, as late as June of 
2009 were saying, oh, it's too soon to go to the Supreme Court. Let's wait, and maybe we'll get a better court. Ha! Huh. Imagine if we'd waited. Imagine if we'd listened to all of those great gay leaders. <laughs> but I digress. No, wow. I, I did not know that that is the reason why it became a focus. Was it? Wow. Yeah. Came out of the pandemic. With so many friends and loved ones dying, how, I, I want to ask how you like went on. In a very literal sense, like how did you not steep into a depression? How does that not like destroy you? Well, it did destroy me. I think in many ways. Um, I uh, I'm still depressed, but you just keep going. Uh, for me, um, my Ric my sweet Ricardo committed suicide, and uh, I had I think I already knew in my heart that I would never do that because of the pain it would cause people who loved me. Uh, there were so many times I wanted to, so many times. Uh, so many times I thought it through, like how to do it. And um, But when Ricardo did it, 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 it was so devastating to me that I, I, I knew that I would never do that. And um, I don't know how I survived. I don't know. Uh, I think it was a big help that by the time I got sick, uh, my parents and my family were supporting me. Having that emotional support is great. Also, you know, I'm an educated white man with a job and an insurance, and I was famous by that point, so I had access to the best medical advice. So I kind of understand how I managed to survive that part. Um, but I think most of the guys I know my age have, uh, I guess you'd call it post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm in a new relationship uh, with somebody who's a lot younger than me and I feel like this last year despite the election um, I'm experiencing joy again uh, I'm really in ridiculously in love and uh, you know I published a book and people like it and so uh, I I tell my boyfriend and he just rolls his eyes but I, I, I think I'm happier now than I have been at any time since AIDS came and killed all my friends. I, I am so grateful to be alive. I think that's amazing. <laughs> how, how did you meet him? A bartender hooked us up. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change, right? <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, I, before I let you go, I just want to ask about Harvey Milk a yeah. bit. Okay. So I want to remember that like legacy. He has this martyrdom to him this hero thing it, was that placed on him after his death or did he have that while he was living harvey was a complicated guy uh what i what i want everybody to know about him and especially younger people is that he was an, in many respects an ordinary man he, in my view he was neither a genius nor a saint his personal life was often a mess uh, he was a terrible businessman usually broke um, he was very kind. He was very funny. He could be a total bitch. Uh, he was the first adult to tell me that I had value as I was. He mentored me. He was there when I, whenever I got my heart broken. Uh, he genuinely loved people and his city and was courageous, but his achievements are ones that I think we can all aspire to. Had he lived, I believe he would have become our mayor. Would he have survived the pandemic? Who knows? But certainly his death, um, he gave us our first real uh, collective martyr. We'd had thousands of martyrs, people who'd been murdered and beaten to death, people who'd taken their own lives, who drank their lives away or overdosed. You know, we've, we've had a lot of martyrs, but Harvey became that kind of unifying symbol. Uh, but even that was being forgotten until Gus and Dustin Lance Black, uh, Gus Van Sant and Dustin Lance Black made the film 
Are, are you, yeah, and are you saying that he became Saint Harvey because we we needed a saint? Yeah, and so it it, it was kind of a, an odd process, but you heard people saying, "Oh, he's our uh, Doctor King," you know, and uh, Harvey would have just, I think, been baffled by that. I mean, he was a little shopkeeper on Castro Street who had a failing camera store and a you know a temper. <laughs> I really, he had a temper and his personal life was tempestuous. Okay. Um, same. Hey, uh, <laughs> I think that can be said about a lot of people. But that was a very important symbol that went out there. And then um, one of the, one of many terrible things about AIDS was that it, uh, you know, it disrupted the transmission of information from one generation to the next because half of my generation got wiped out and those of us who survived, many of us don't want to talk about any of it because it's too painful still. Uh, so his memory was beginning to recede. And we had a, a, a core group of, of, of what began as many people and dwindled over the years to a very handful who were doing whatever we could to keep his name alive. But I would go and speak at, at universities with tons of uh, LGBT people in the audience and I'd say how many of you know who Harvey Milk was and you know maybe one or two hands would go up but Gus and Lance changed that with Milk and Sean Penn's portrayal uh, it uh, unearthed this story in a way that was really I think important and powerful and ABC's miniseries uh, When We Rise I, I have, a, you know, I have, I have kind of complicated feelings about the miniseries. Uh, it's not particularly accurate in many areas, but I think it is largely truthful. And I'm really grateful that it happened. Yeah. Well, I'm continually frustrated at our, our lack of history, paying attention to it, but also the lack of just records. So uh, I know you said it's not... Oh, it's easy. I really appreciate you coming here and talking with my us. My pleasure. It's been great. My pleasure. Absolutely. If people want to find out more about you, they can get the book. Yes, buy my book, it's When, we, when rise. we Rise. Let's make it a bestseller. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. And if you want to find our other inf interviews, you can go to iTunes, YouTube, and we will see you next week. Goodbye. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. 